you know, of course, we've had a number of debates here, and, and I know those that uh, who represent us in those d debates would never sign on to a proposition as this dilemma is uh, presented. There's, in logic, there's a something called a fallacy of insufficient options, and that's what Eric was talking about, that the uh, options were not exhaustive. So anytime you get in a debate, you gotta be very, very precise about the propositions. You know, some would say that, that this uh, dilemma that is presented um, had an excluded middle, but it didn't because it didn't consider all the options. So I, I think that I may do a lesson on that sometime. I have to think about it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, as we uh, had said about uh, profits, uh, the minor profits, and they're only called minor because they're shorter in in uh, length and then the major profit, the four major profits. But the um, thing about the the profits is, and the relevance that they have today is that they demonstrate how God deals with people. He either deals with sin. His attitude towards it, um, what he uh, will tolerate and won't tolerate, when he will uh, render punishment and will he will, when he will not. And I think it's very relevant today. We all know the uh, sad state of affairs of our country. And I'm not going to say that that uh, th this is peculiar to the United States because it's not. This is happening all over the world. And the question is, is God indifferent to the moral condition of the United States, Texas, California, you know, UK, Iran? Is God indifferent to that? And, I, and we will see from the prophets that he is not indifferent to it. He will have something to say about it, and he will deal with it. Exactly when, I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't hear that. What was it? <laughs> oh, the door. Yeah, okay. Probably somebody wants to get in. That's a good deduction. <laughs> I, well, there's no dilemma if somebody comes in here. <laughs> it's a dilemma for the person who comes in. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, like I say, uh, God is not indifferent to the, the uh, moral condition of the United States today, or any nation for that matter. And we can see from the prophets that he will, in fact, deal with this immorality at some point in time. Now, don't you know? Assume the attitude that you know that he's going to take care of it next year, because you don't. It may be that all of us in this room will be dead before anything happens. We just don't know. But we do know for certainty that he's going to deal with it. Yeah, that's one of the, uh, I guess, advantages or th uh, things about Obadiah. It, it, it is the uh, shortest book in the uh, Bible, just one chapter, one chapter book. But it has some very uh, timeless lessons. And, and the thing that you will see from almost every prophet is that there's condemnation of sin but there's always hope offered. Now I got to reading the uh, introduction to Obadiah in my Bible, and it was saying that there's no hope offered. Well, that's not true. 
Now you look at uh, verse 17, there's at least the implication that there's hope offered, but it wasn't in Edom. It was in Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem. So there's always condemnation of sin. There is always the prospect of punishment if one does not repent. There is always the hope of salvation through repentance. And you'll find that throughout all the prophets. You also find that to uh, be true of any nation that is engaged in immorality. The United States could be the uh, strongest uh, nation. Well, it may, it may be the strongest nation today uh, economically and maybe even militarily. But I wouldn't say it is politically. But it could be the, the strongest. If we were just to get back to a biblical basis of morality. A country cannot exist without uh, biblical morality, uh, a biblical foundation, religious foundation. A nation just cannot exist. It can exist for a thousand years, I don't know, but eventually it's, it's going to cease to exist. Another interesting thing about uh, these, these uh, prophets not all prophets, but uh, some of these, is that we don't really know much about them. They come into existence for a specific purpose. You may find some things about them, but they exist for that specific purpose, and you never hear anything else about them. Uh, most of the prophets were have been quoted in the uh, New Testament, not, but not all. Uh, Obadiah is one of them. It's not quoted in the New Testament. It's not referred to in the New Testament. But the uh, lesson is still timely. You pick up the newspaper, and you could be reading Obadiah. <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, and I would say also that uh, uh, there's always a political situation in all these, uh, uh, you know, these all these prophets are dealing with. It's within the context of some sort of political, something or other, turmoil or uh, political problems or uh, degeneracy or what, whatever you want to call it. So the uh, message of, of uh, Obadiah, I might add, the reason I'm doing this first, I'm following the out, the uh, sequence of prophets that Homer Haley has put forth. And we really don't know exactly when Obadiah was, was written, but there, there are some very good arguments to say that it was the first uh, prophet, book of prophecy, written. And I think we also said last week that you shouldn't view prophecy as necessarily foretelling of a, a future event, you know, like a crystal ball and I can tell you what's going to happen next week. That's, that's not the idea of prophecy. Sometimes they do and you'll find that there's always the prediction of destruction if you don't repent. Uh, that's not so much a specific uh, uh, event at a specific time, but, but it will happen. A prophet is more the idea of, of God has a message for the people, or certain people, and this prophet is the one who is to deliver that message. It may uh, involve a foretelling of future events, but it's primarily a foretelling of a message that comes from God, so just keep that in mind. Now, what was the political situation at the time of Obadiah? Well, it had to do something with uh, Jerusalem, of course. It had to do with some invasion by somebody, uh, Jerusalem. And don't think it was the uh, invasion by Nebuchadnezzar, because it's the destruction of the temple is just not mentioned here. 
So it could be some other invasion that happened uh, after, certainly after the uh, division of the uh, nation of Israel into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. It certainly happened after that. But don't know exactly when it was. So, uh, but a lot of the uh, scholars believe that it was around in the 800 BC, somewhere around in there. Now, what is Obadiah dealing with? Certainly he's dealing with the fall of Edom. And uh, of course you know that, that uh, this conflict between Edom and Israel or Israel and Judah, this conflict had been going on quite some time. You know that uh, Jacob's brother was uh, Esau, and Esau, being the kind of fellow that he was, even though he was a, the firstborn, he sold his birthright to uh, Jacob for a pot of porridge. <clears throat> And somebody had uh, uh, had a sermon one time on the high cost of a bowl of soup. Well, he gave up his birthright for this pot of porridge. And Jacob also uh, sort of, uh, well, in conjunction with his mother, deceived uh, uh, his father from... Uh, blessing Esau by deceiving, I guess Isaac was very poor health, but not very good eyesight, put a, some sheepskin on uh, Jacob because he wasn't a real hairy fellow like Esau was, and fooled Isaac, and as a result, Isaac blessed Jacob with what should have been uh, a blessing for Esau. So that caused animosity between uh, Jacob and Esau, and that, uh, of course, lasted uh, for the nations that eventually grew out of these two families. Even though they, there seemed to be a reconciliation when Jacob came back from, uh, if you want to call it exile, came back from exile, and, and he was welcomed by Esau. But that's the last time that they had harmonious relationships, so. There's always been animosity between uh, Israel and e uh, Esau or e uh, Edom. Of course, Edom was a nation that that uh, resulted from Esau. So, <clears throat> what's the lessons to be learned from uh, Obadiah? And we'll go through it verse by verse. You'll see here from this uh, particular. Uh, book that there is a lot of pride involved on the part of Edom and it resulted in cruelty towards their kinfolk the uh, Israelites so the lesson that uh, for us today is that the injustice uh, cruelty and and what have you uh, uh, just, God does not condone that uh, those things must uh, be avenged. Another is that when uh, one shares in the spoils of wrongdoing, and you may not be guilty of the wrongdoing itself, but if you share in the spoils of wrongdoing knowingly, I, I know there could be times when you may receive things uh, that were obtained by nefarious methods and not know it. But if you do know it, and all you do is share in the spoils, then you must uh, uh, share some of the guilt also. The old adage that uh, you know, whatever one sows that he shall reap, that applies to Edom or Esau if you want to go back to the uh, patriarch. 
whatever is, is sowed, it will be uh, punished. And as, uh, as I said, in all these books of, of the prophets, there is the uh, warning of destruction if one does not repent. But there's always the hope of redemption through repentance and a turning back towards God. And that's the same thing that we see here, in, like I said in verse 17, that, that uh, God always provides a means of escape from whatever destruction he has pronounced. He always provides a means of escape in a time and a place if one will just repent and turn back to him. That's a great lesson for us today and, and uh, uh, should always keep that in mind. Now, the place that the nation of Edom occupied was, if you can envision the uh, area of uh, Palestine, you know, you know, you have the Dead Sea and it's a very, we would kind of think of it as Odessa in August. It was a, it was a very in, his, inhospitable place. At least we would probably think so. But it was kind of south of the uh, Dead Sea. And if the Dead Sea was on a north-south uh, uh, axis, they would be a little bit to the east of that axis at the bottom of the Dead Sea area. Very rough area. Very dry, very, uh, it's almost a desert, craggy uh, hills and what have you. And in terms of um, defense, probably not a bad place if you're trying to defend yourself against uh, invaders. Probably not all that a bad place. The Germans were done very well there. <laughs> they were they were great at defense, and uh, so they would have done very well. And apparently, uh, Edom did pretty well there also. But nevertheless, that would tend to uh, make them prideful. It would tend to make them think that. They were indestructible because of they were in a, a geographical area that was very easy to defend. But let's see what uh, the book itself has to say about all this. I'm, of course, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Like I said, we don't really know who this Obadiah is. There are a number of Obadiahs that, have, that are mentioned in the Old Testament. We can't specifically identify any of those with this book. But whether we can or not, it's still a, a, a timely message for us today. And it says here, the vision of Obadiah. You know, there was a number of ways that prophets re received messages. Uh, visions was one of them, dreams were another. And, uh, but since he received a vision, and it says, again in verse 1, uh, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. So here you have the authority for the, uh, the message itself. It's a, it, it comes in a vision. It's not a false prophecy. It's, a, it's something that the Lord is saying to Obadiah and he gives the subject matter that he's going to be dealing with. Thus says the Lord God, the authority concerning Edom, the subject matter. And we have heard a report from the Lord. We really don't know who the we is. It could be just a, a generic sort of term. But it's a report and may, uh, I think King James may say messenger. Uh, we have heard a report from the Lord. So this message is coming directly from God himself. 
And it says, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Well, this um, judgment on Esau is going to apply or involve more than just Israel or Judah, as the case may be. It's going to involve a lot of nations. And the message uh, that was sent says, Arise and let us rise up against her for battle. And this is a rise up against Edom. So it's laying the groundwork for the uh, punishment of Edom for its destruction. Now, Edom was very prideful. Uh, you'll see that through this book. And the message from God is, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. So whatever pride they had, it, it didn't matter. They, they thought themselves, they kind of enlarged their image of themselves among the nations, but it didn't matter because God was going to make them small among the nations. And even though Edom may have been uh, viewed with respect among the nations at the time, uh, they were they were a very wealthy nation uh, to be so small. He said, "I will make you small among the nations." In fact, they became so small they went out of existence. <laughs> you shall be greatly despised. So whatever high regard that uh, uh, was held for them before is going to go away. From a high regard, they're going to be despised. Now, you also have to think about the political situation of among nations. You know, a nation that is despised usually is one that's uh, being attacked and uh, defeated. You know, one may not have any personal animosity towards a nation, but if you can attack them and defeat them, you know, that's considered uh, being despised. And it says here in verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Well, that's one of the problems that uh, Edom had, is uh, uh, the evil of pride. And pride is deceptive. You know, you can't, we're talking about uh, rationality tonight, the dilemma. If you think rationally, uh, you can't let pride get in your way. Pride will cause one to uh, perceive things that are not there. Perceive a situation to be such, and it's not really the case. So he says, your pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Now, as I said, the uh, uh, geography of where the uh, nation of, of Edom was, was very, uh, well, we probably considered it very in, inhospitable. Very defensible, though. And one might think that because of the geography, uh, rather because of themselves, rather than the geography, that they are so powerful that nobody can, can defeat them. Where in fact, it's just the geography, it's just the difficulty of conducting military operations in such an inhospitable area. So he says, yeah, these cliffs, your habitation high, it was kind of a high desert, you might call it that. Uh, you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Well, in terms of human uh, way of thinking about things, that very well may have been the case. It may have been difficult to bring them down to the ground to defeat them in battle. But with God, all things are possible. So one shouldn't... Uh, uh, resort to false security 
when operating in defiance of God and, and uh, his uh, wishes. And though you exalt yourself as high as the eagle, the eagle, of course, is soaring in the air, and who can bring down the eagle that's, uh, that's uh, on wing? Nobody would think that they could do that. And though you set your nest among the stars, well, that's pretty high. That's pretty uh, remote from attack by anybody. From there, I will bring you down, says the Lord. Nothing is um, secure from God when there's a punishment declared against that nation. It doesn't matter how high they are, how powerful they think they may be, even though they may be powerful, they could be. Even though they think themselves so far beyond other nations that they are among the, the stars or they, their nest, as it says here, is among the stars, God will still bring them down. Now, do we as a nation think that we <laughs> reside among the stars? If people think about anything, they most likely think that this nation has always existed from the day of creation. They don't know history, so they think this has always existed. And they may think that it will always exist. And the government will always send them a check. <laughs> but that's just not the way it is. And Edom is going to find that out. It says here in verse 5, If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Anybody ever had uh, a break-in in their home or, or shop? <laughs> Do they take every last thing that there is? No, they grab the good stuff and, and uh, as much as they can carry, and they're gone. But this is not going to be the case with Edom. It's just going to be like a uh, thief that comes in by a night, and he takes every last thing that there is, just wind up with bare walls, and he's going to search and find everything. It's not a matter of just taking enough until they uh, had enough. They never have enough. And that's where it's going to be with Edom. And, you know, if you're ever involved in harvesting crops, there's always something left over. And it's just not worth the uh, time and effort and the cost of gathering every last bit of uh, harvest or crop out in the field. You're always going to leave something. But not here. Not here. You're not going not to leave. There's not going to be anything left. Zero. So the picture of a destruction upon Edom is very, very uh, severe. In verse 6, Oh, how Esau shall, shall be searched out, how his hidden treasures shall be sought after. It's no good for Edom to have a, a floor safe. <laughs> it's still going to be found. He's <laughs> going to be searched out. Whatever hidden treasures he, he has, it's going to be found, and it's going to be taken. It's a picture of just utter devastation. And this is punishment. This is punishment for sin. In verse 7, all the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you, and no one is aware of it. For those of you that are, are uh, students of history, you know how 
uh, confederacies or uh, alliances are violated right and left when those that are part of the alliance determine, even though their agreement calls for them to uh, assist another nation from attack by a third nation, they'll make an assessment at that point in time whether it's to their benefit to do so or not, and they don't care whether there's a, an alliance or not. They're not going to honor it if it's to their disadvantage. And that's the same thing that uh, is the case here. It was not to their advantage, these whoever it was in this confederacy, and you might just think it's the uh, nations around Edom, it was not within uh, to their advantage to honor the confederacy of, of these, these uh, nations, the alliance of these nations. And not only that, it seems from this that they were going to participate in the uh, destruction of, of uh, Edom because <laughs> they could gain from it. Uh, like I say, Edom was a um, prosperous nation, so they probably provided a lot of benefits to the nations around them. A lot of nations around them could eat bread because of their alliance with uh, Edom. So. These people that, that relied upon Edom, that they had an alliance with Edom, they're going to lay a trap for uh, Edom when it comes up at the time of their destruction. And there's nobody in Edom that's aware of this. At the time of this prophecy, Edom is not aware of this. Oh, we got to be sure to keep that door locked. <laughs> you know, you can't tell anybody just walks in. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, anyway, um, it says no one aware it. We'll we'll do verse eight, and then we'll stop there. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Uh, uh, Edom was known for its wise men. But their wisdom, all their collective wisdom, was not going to prevent them from being destroyed. So uh, whatever understanding they had, they didn't understand this. They were going to be destroyed if and we'll see that they, there was an option that they could prevent this. So we're we'll start at verse uh, 9. Well, maybe start verse 8 again. But, but some of them, where they we'll start somewhere in there next time. So thank you for your attention and, and attendance. <laughs>